Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. Today, I'm going to tell you about Tom, a retired high school teacher who ate a strict carnivore diet. He went all in on this meat diet, expecting health benefits, but instead, it almost cost him his life. Tom and his wife Patty recently returned from a fishing trip. Bored of eating fish day after day, Tom went to the local farmer's market to prepare for a red meat feast. When he got home, he fried it all up and they enjoyed a delicious dinner together. After dinner, Patty went out to her book club meeting and Tom went to the living room to watch the football game. While Patty and her friends were discussing a tragedy in their book, The Covenant of Water, they were blissfully unaware of a tragedy that was unfolding back at home. Tom was fighting for his life. About an hour later, Patty returned home to a horrifying sight. Tom, who seemed perfectly fine after dinner, was now slumped over the side of the couch, unresponsive and barely breathing. In a panic, Patty called 911. After explaining the situation, the operator calmly walked her through what to do step by step. She pressed her fingers into Tom's neck and couldn't feel a pulse, and she wasn't sure if he was still breathing. The operator told Patty to bring Tom to the ground and to start CPR. Fifteen agonizing minutes later, she finally heard the sirens approaching. Covered in sweat and tears, she yelled for them to come to the living room. Miraculously, when the paramedics checked, Tom had a pulse. It was weak and rapid, but it was there. Within minutes, they were speeding down the highway towards the hospital. Tom was in critical condition. His blood pressure was perilously low, his heart was racing, and his oxygen levels were dropping. As they rushed him into the hospital, the medical team was ready. In these moments, when you walk into a room and you see a crashing patient, it's like time slows down as your mind is filtering through a huge amount of information in a matter of seconds. The emergency doctor's eyes darted from Tom to the cardiac monitor. Tom was conscious and moaning, immediately giving them some reassurance that his airway wasn't blocked. But his breathing was shallow and his oxygen levels wouldn't budge above 85%, even though he was receiving the maximum amount of oxygen. And his blood pressure was low, only 77 over 50, despite having an IV running fluids in as fast as possible. So we have two issues, low oxygen and low blood pressure. Our priority is getting his oxygen levels up, but in reality, we have to work on both at the same time. Knowing that Tom had just had CPR for 15 minutes, where Patty was pushing on his ribcage hard enough to compress his heart and circulate his blood, it's very likely he has broken ribs. And the sharp edges of a broken rib can puncture a lung and cause it to collapse. So the doctor listened to Tom's lungs carefully, and he heard normal breath sounds on both sides of the chest. So his low oxygen levels probably aren't due to a completely collapsed lung. Tom winced in pain every time he was moved, and even when the stethoscope was placed on his chest. So a stat portable chest x-ray was ordered, which confirmed that he did have multiple broken ribs from the CPR and a possible pneumonia on the right side. Both of these findings could explain his low oxygen levels. Not only does a pneumonia prevent air from entering part of the lung, but Tom was in so much pain from the rib fractures that he couldn't take a proper breath in. In this situation, when you have a patient who's critically ill, who has low oxygen levels, who just recently had a cardiac arrest, and who's still drowsy, it's critical to get control of their airway. So Tom's doctors decided to intubate him, which means putting a breathing tube down his throat. Now for this procedure, we usually sedate patients, but a sedating medication can drop Tom's blood pressure even further, which could be deadly. He'd already received three liters of IV fluids and his blood pressure hadn't budged. To put that into context, the average man only has five liters of circulating blood. So that's not a good sign. So they need to intensify Tom's treatment with a medication called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a medication that increases the patient's blood pressure by causing their blood vessels to constrict, similarly to the way your body reacts to adrenaline in a fight or flight scenario. And it worked. Tom's blood pressure rose to a safer zone within minutes. Now Tom's doctors were able to safely perform a rapid sequence intubation and hook Tom up to life support. This is really how it goes in a critical life-threatening scenario. You always have to stabilize your patient first and often with very little information. Then you have time to run tests and figure things out and really nail down the diagnosis. Now the question is, why is Tom so sick? What's going on here? And can we fix the problem? So at this point, 
All we know is that Tom is in shock. Your organs need a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients. And if something happens to disrupt the amount of blood flow going to your organs, then your body goes into a state of shock. The challenge is there's many different types of shock and they're often treated differently. And if you give the wrong treatment, it could be fatal. Tom's blood work came back showing an elevated lactate level more evidence that he's in shock and that his organs aren't getting enough oxygen. It's similar to when you sprint and lactic acid builds up in your muscles. His blood work also shows an elevated white blood cell count and C-reactive protein, which suggests there's some kind of infection or inflammation. And remember, we did see a possible pneumonia on his chest x-ray, and that could explain his blood work. So for now, that's gonna be our leading diagnosis pneumonia causing septic shock. But how does an infection lead to shock and such a shocking low blood pressure? This is a fascinating topic. And to put it simply, in septic shock, your immune system overreacts to an infection, flooding your body with chemical signals that cause your blood vessels to dilate and become leaky. And that's what causes your blood pressure to drop. We need to act quickly the moment we even consider this could be septic shock, we have to give antibiotics immediately. That's because every hour we delay giving antibiotics, a patient's risk of dying increases by 8%. So now Tom's receiving IV fluids, norepinephrine, antibiotics, and corticosteroids to treat possible septic shock. But hold on, things aren't quite adding up for me. Tom went from being completely fine to having a cardiac arrest just a few hours later. It's not really the timeline I would expect for septic shock. So what else could it be? In a middle-aged man, we have to think about a cardiac cause. Could this have been a heart attack or an abnormal heart rhythm? Doesn't look like it. He had a normal echo and a normal ECG. What about a pulmonary embolism? A large enough blood clot in his lungs could definitely drop his oxygen levels and his blood pressure. But his CT angiogram didn't show any signs of an obstruction. We can also cross off hypovolemic because he's not bleeding and he has no reason to be dehydrated. So we're left with the category of distributive shock. So it still could be septic shock, but it just doesn't quite fit. So Tom's doctor went back to speak with Patty. He wanted to hear every detail she could remember. Patty took a deep breath and thought back to dinner. Tom had been feeling well that day. He hadn't been coughing or feeling sick. They'd had the exact same meal countless times before, and he'd never had any issues. Then Patty paused. She recalled that when she was heading out for her book club, Tom had mentioned that he was itchy, and she just told him to put on some cream. Itching, interesting. Could this have been the first sign of an allergic reaction? Anaphylaxis is a severe, life-threatening allergic reaction. And as you might remember, it's one of the causes of distributive shock. But that would be unusual too. Anaphylaxis usually happens quickly when you're exposed to something you're allergic to. A classic example would be a bee sting that rapidly leads to hives and swelling of the lips and the throat. Any Bridgerton fans out there will know what I mean. But anaphylaxis isn't always so obvious. There's a huge range of potential symptoms. And rarely, it is possible to have a delayed anaphylactic reaction. So Tom's doctors sent off blood work looking for signs of an allergic reaction. And it's a good thing they did, because his tryptase level came back five times the upper limit of normal. Tryptase is an enzyme made by your immune system. Think of it like an allergy alarm bell. When your body detects something it's allergic to, special cells will release tryptase to sound the alarm. And it's not usually elevated in septic shock. So even though we saw that possible pneumonia, we can be pretty confident that Tom's actually in anaphylactic shock. And if there's one thing I really want you to remember, it's that you treat anaphylaxis with epinephrine, which is what's in an EpiPen. And that's what they did. Tom's doctors quickly switched him from norepinephrine to epinephrine. But we're not finished yet. What could have possibly caused the reaction? It doesn't sound like he was swarmed by bees, and he hasn't added anything new to his diet. And if we don't know the trigger, how can we prevent it from happening again? So Tom's doctors called the allergy specialist to come investigate. The allergist on call spoke with Patty, and she heard the same story. Sausage, hamburger, itching. But our next question was a surprise. Had Tom been exposed to any ticks recently? As you may recall, Tom and Patty had been on a fishing trip a few weeks ago, and he had found a Lone Star tick in his belly button, and he wasn't sure how long it had been there. Why is that relevant? Well, when the tick burrowed into Tom's skin, it injected a molecule called alpha-gal right into his bloodstream. And alpha-gal is a carbohydrate that's found in all mammals except 
humans and higher primates. So when Tom's immune system came in contact with alpha-gal, it identified it as foreign and kind of freaked out and started creating IgE antibodies. And this is a critical point because IgE antibodies are responsible for anaphylactic reactions. Over the next few weeks, Tom's immune system pumped out tons of these antibodies. So they were ready and waiting for alpha-gal, which flooded Tom's system when he had his red meat feast. At this point, an overwhelming immune reaction took place. Chemical signals like histamine were released in huge quantities, which caused his blood vessels to dilate and his blood pressure to drop. That's what caused Tom to go into shock. So we've got a great theory, but how do we prove it? Fortunately, there's a blood test to detect IgE antibodies against alpha-gal. And Tom's levels were sky high. So we finally have our diagnosis. Tom has alpha-gal syndrome. it was only first described in 2009, just 14 years ago. And I think how it was discovered is really interesting. It all came down to geography. A new cancer medication called cetuximab was being tested. And strangely enough, patients in the southeast of the United States were having these severe allergic reactions. And in the same area, other patients were having allergic reactions linked to red meat. In a stroke of genius, researchers realized that all these reactions were happening in the same area where you can find Lone Star ticks. And what do cetuximab, red meat, and Lone Star ticks have in common? That's right, alpha-gal. And here's why I think you need to know about alpha-gal syndrome. At least half a million Americans are living with this condition and having allergic reactions to red meat. But that number is probably a lot higher because the condition is likely underdiagnosed for a couple of reasons. There's a huge range of severity from a stomach ache or itchy skin a few hours after eating to a full-blown cardiac arrest like Tom experienced. Unlike most food allergies where the reaction happens within minutes, Alpha-gal reactions are delayed. They take two to eight hours to develop. So patients and their healthcare providers may not make the connection to red meat. And unfortunately, there are many patients that carry a misdiagnosis, like irritable bowel syndrome or chronic diarrhea before the proper diagnosis is made. Plus, the reactions can be unpredictable. A food that you might tolerate one day, you might react to the next day. And this isn't just an issue for people living in the Southern United States. Different types of ticks around the world are being linked to alpha-gal syndrome. And alarmingly, tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease are on the rise. Even here in Canada, we're seeing a lot more ticks as temperatures climb and they expand their home turf. So not only are ticks gross to look at, but they burrow into your skin and they can be deadly. So prevention is key. So I bet some of you are thinking, wait a minute, when I eat red meat, my immune system gets exposed to alpha-gal too. So why don't we all react to red meat? While the exact mechanism is still being researched, here's what we know so far. Our immune system can produce different types of antibodies. Interestingly, we all have antibodies against alpha-gal circulating in our blood, but it's a type of antibody called IgG, and that doesn't trigger an allergic reaction. But researchers believe something in the tick saliva manipulates our immune system to create IgE antibodies instead, which are responsible for the reaction. So we figured out what's going on, but are patients still in the ICU? So what happened to Tom? Over the next few days, Tom's blood pressure improved, he was weaned off life support, and he was successfully extubated. He still had to recover from those horrible rib fractures, but he was through the worst of it. Now he has to adapt to a big lifestyle change, avoiding anything with alpha-gal in it and carrying around at least one EpiPen anywhere he goes in case he has another allergic reaction. Obviously, he cannot eat red meat, but he actually can have fish, seafood, and poultry because they don't contain alpha-gal. So I guess it's possible for him to stick to his carnivore diet, but I wouldn't recommend it. He also has to avoid gelatin, which is in so many things, and not just gummy bears. I recently learned that it's even used in the clarification of some juices and wines. Who knew? Alpha-gal is also found in places you might not expect. Think about heart valve replacement from pigs and cows. Those would not be easy to remove. But it's not all doom and gloom. There's a silver lining, a glimmer of hope. For many people, the allergy wanes over years. And your doctor can actually track the levels of IgE antibodies against alpha-gal circulating in your blood. The moral of the story is, try not to get bitten by ticks. And take a CPR course so you can be a hero like Patty. Do you have any experience with ticks or allergies? 
Let me know in the comments below. This video was adapted from a published medical case. So if you want to check it out, I'll leave a link in the description. And a huge thank you to my friend, Dr. Blair Bigham for peer reviewing this video. He's an ER and ICU doctor, a lover of all things ticks, and the author of the best-selling book, Death Interrupted, how modern medicine is complicating the way we die. If you enjoyed this type of medical mystery video, well, I've got a whole playlist going, so check it out. Be sure to like and subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.